who owns and perpetuates the story of Africa. This is something I ask myself even as I'm scrolling through Lonely Planet's list of 10 things to do when you're in Nairobi from a local perspective. Those lists always have the thing of giving a giraffe food at giraffe center, yeah? Or feeding a baby elephant and let it be made, like, let there be no mistake, I'm not hating on these things. I think they're really cute things that you should all do if you haven't. What I'm saying is, so many stories about us has, have been written by foreigners and for such a long time that even we have accepted it and even we look towards foreign content to understand things about ourselves. And that is where I think the mistake lies. I mean, how many times is it that you go to look at a foreign website to find information about, say, South Africa or Malawi? How many times is it that you watch a vlog by a foreigner who's not African to learn about experiences in Lesotho? The thing that I keep wondering is, is it because we don't love ourselves, that we don't center ourselves in our stories, or is it something that has been passed on to us? How many here have been up the KICC rooftop? Anyone? Okay. Okay, good, we have a few numbers. If you haven't, I really think you should go, honestly. It's one of the best views of this city that you'll ever see. For me, the journey towards loving Nairobi and loving my home started on top of that rooftop in 2010, which is around the same time that I picked up a camera. And I remember, yeah, that was in a time where I was beardless and dreadlockless. I was a young man. And when I went up there that first day, I remember it was like my eyes, I saw this city in a way that I'd never, ever seen Nairobi before. I remember the sun had not yet set. I was just there watching the sun go down. It was after five, so traffic was starting to build up. People were going home from the offices. And I just sat there, I couldn't do anything. I just sat up there. People were coming out there, people in couples, people just coming to see Nairobi with the sun going down. And the sun went down, the lights started coming on, the traffic, as you can see, you know, the lights coming on, and you can just see the trail of red lights, people going home, people stuck in traffic. I remember looking down and thinking, I can, I, I feel like I'm far removed from all that is happening down there, but somehow I feel very connected to every single person that's down there. That day for me started a journey that is continuing till now. And I know I've told you about what the city looked like, and I could tell you more, but the reason I'm a photographer is not so that I tell you how places look like, right? It's so that I show you. I remember rushing back home that same night, going onto the computer and Googling Nairobi, and I wanted to see if the images that I'll see online are representative of the view that I saw that evening in, at KICC. And unfortunately, they weren't. A lot of that was, you know, whether it's the Dandora rubbish heap, the famous heap of Dandora, the famous roofs of Kibera. There was a lot that was not the beauty that I'd seen in the city that I'd grown to love. And I remember thinking to myself, do you want to mean that when people Google Nairobi from all over the world, this is the first thing that they see? And for me, that saddened me. And I decided that day that I was going to change that. I will make sure that when people Google us, they see something that is more representative of the beauty that I've gotten accustomed to. And so I started shooting the city, and I shot from so many angles. I shot from the city, I'm not afraid of heights, if anyone is wondering. And as I kept shooting, I kept seeing this city from different angles. I kept seeing some of the things that were beautiful about the city, and also some of the things that were tragic about the city. And I put these images online. Remember, my mission was 
put these images online so that as they look at us, as they look at us, they see something beautiful, right? But the interesting thing was that I started, the comments that I started seeing on my website were not really from foreigners. They were from Kenyans, specifically people in Nairobi. And at first, most of the comments were of disbelief. Most people were like, I don't see how that is possible that this is Nairobi. At that time, Kenya Power was cutting electricity every so often. So people are also like, ah, with the Kenya Power that we have, that's impossible. That can be Nairobi. Nairobi can be that lit. But then the, in, the comments started changing. They became a lot more positive. They stopped being, oh, only Photoshop can make Nairobi look like that, to you've done such a good job with representing our city. The comments started having people saying thank you for some reason, for me showing them a Nairobi that I'd not seen before. People would go up KICC and then tag me in their pictures that they will take. One person even suggested that I should be tasked with the responsibility of marketing the country, which as much as I agreed to, the government didn't, so here we are. The curiosity that I had of Nairobi and the love and drive that I had for shooting Nairobi from so many places also ignited something in me that wanted to see other African cities. I wondered whether they looked like Nairobi did. I wondered whether the images that I saw online about other African cities, were they also another misrepresentation or maybe a one-sided view of African cities? And so, after a few years, I got together with a couple of friends, a photographer, an illustrator, and a videographer. And we said we will travel around African cities to photograph them and document them for other people to see. The first step was to go down South Africa. And we decided to go down nine countries, traveling in a car. I remember we covered 18,000 kilometers over 104 days. It was a long time. But the thing that happened is that we had such a vast number of experiences that really changed our view on African cities. I have so many stories that if you sit with me, I could tell you about the experiences that we had. I will share a few because I can't tell you all of them. But I could tell you about the Tanzanian cop who stopped me and asked me for my Kibali Charasta, which ideally would mean a permit for my dreadlocks. And I honestly thought the guy was joking until we were there for maybe 20 minutes and he was still asking for my permit and I was still trying to explain where I come from, we don't need permits for hairstyles. He finally let me go. Obviously I didn't show him anything because anyone who has dreadlocks knows that we don't show our membership cards to the uninitiated. I could tell you about the two times that we slept on the side of the road. Once in Tanzania, because car travel. Once in Tanzania, where we actually set up our tents right beside the highway, and every time a truck would pass by, we would wake up because it just felt like it was going right by the ear. Or the second time in the Western Cape of South Africa, where we couldn't set up a tent, so we had to sleep in the car, and the temperatures dropped down to about zero degrees. That wasn't fun. I could tell you about Botswana, where driving on the highways of Botswana is like a game drive. You're more likely to meet an elephant than to meet another car. I could tell you about that, but let me show you. The elephant was so close that I shot that with my phone. I could tell you about the experience of being hit by water from all sides, from the top, from the bottom, from the sides, standing under the mighty Mosi Otunya, which translates to the smoke that thunders, or what you might know as Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe and Zambia. And standing under those falls, just seeing them and the water was full, was an experience that every single time I think about or every time I talk about it, I just feel like I've been transported back there. If you're like me, and probably some of you are, 
you probably think that when you cross the border into Namibia, the desert starts, right? Just me? No? No one else? Okay, clearly just me. So imagine my surprise when we cross the border into Namibia and we drive five hours without even seeing a speck of sand. I have to say I was a bit disappointed. But then we go to Windhoek and we find this seemingly European small city nestled in the middle of this valley, hidden in there in the middle of the great Namibian country. I was shocked because in my mind, that's not what a city in Namibia looked like. I could tell you about how big and how on top of the world I felt, standing on top of one of the largest sand dunes in the world, Big Daddy. Or how small I felt standing in front of one of the largest gorges that I've seen in my life, the Fish River Canyon. Everywhere that we went, we experienced something that we'd not experienced before. In some strange stroke of, I don't know, romantic notion, the first time that I've touched snow in my life was in Lesotho, an African country, which I think goes to show that everything that you might need, you can find on this continent. The food, honestly, was always hot, was always amazing. And to me, I'm happy that there was ugali everywhere that we went, even though it had different names and different consistencies, from pap in South Africa, sadza in Zimbabwe, and nsima in Malawi. But we enjoyed every single meal. We even commandeered this restaurant in Maputo called Kwetu, which is an East African restaurant. The minute I found that they had chapati, that was it. They became our base of operations for the four days that we were in Maputo. I was amazed by the kindness of strangers, people that didn't have to, but they helped us. I could tell you about Hawa from Haburon, who went out of her way to help us find a home, took care of us when we were broke and overstayed our time in Haburon. I could tell you about Mansa Kunta from Lesotho, lives in Maseru, who even gifted us with traditional Sotho blankets. He's a proud Sotho man who showed us around his country, and in exchange, all we could do was give him a, a Maasai blanket, which honestly will not even help him in the winter of Lesotho, but at least he can use it in summer. People had so many questions because they had not been used to seeing Africans, let alone Kenyans, who travel by car all the way down to South Africa. Because who would do that? They kept asking us, why? Why would you do this? It can't be easy. It can't be cheap. And honestly, most of the time, I asked myself, why? And then I just asked myself, why not? Because I was curious about the people, I was curious about African cities and African places, and the only way that I thought that I could get this experience was by getting out and doing it. And people were very happy to see other Africans doing that trip. They told us so many stories, and we shared stories of where we came from from them. And I'm hoping that some of them are now curious about Nairobi, and they will visit Kenya at any time they get. What we were trying to do with our trip was to experience Africa as Africans and be able to tell stories to other Africans that center ourselves, stories that use us as the priority. Our stories, we call it a story of Africa by Africans and for Africans first. And that has been the intention of the whole, of the whole trip. And I really hope that from now, even in the stories that we tell, even in the things that we share, even in the very minute experiences, that we can continue to center ourselves as Africans in our stories and to tell our stories in a way that prioritizes us as the audience and then the rest of the world. As I finish, I'm going to tell you one short story. 
about a time in 2015 that I got up, like I sometimes do, not always, very early in the morning to photograph the sun, sunrise in Nairobi City at uh, Uhuru Park. And the sun rises from behind the buildings. It's a beautiful sight. And on this morning, I was driving there, I parked my car, and I look out as I'm carrying out my tripod, and there's this dark cloud of smoke in the horizon. I'm wondering what is going on. So I get on Twitter quickly, and I find that Gikomba is on fire. Gikomba is one of Nairobi's largest market, and it was on fire. And I look at what is going on, and the fire has been raging all night. And as much as I'm so happy that nobody had been hurt in the fire, though people had lost millions of shillings of property and goods. And the sight that I saw, honestly, was something a little eerie. But I stayed and kept shooting because the sun was about to rise. And as I kept shooting, I kept looking. I couldn't focus on shooting only. I had to be, keep checking Twitter to see if there's any updates about what is going on and then shoot, and then get on Twitter, and then shoot. And when the sun started rising, I was hit with one of the most beautiful sights I'd ever seen. And I remember showing this to a friend of mine who said, that seems to be like the typical story of Kenya, and I guess by extension Africa, beauty and tragedy. And that has stuck with me since that time. And every time that I'm shooting, I encourage myself that even in the most tragic of situations, to try and see the beauty that lies in there. And to understand that even if something has the most beauty, there will always be stories of tragedy. The hard thing is to make sure that either one does not blind you from the other. Thank you. <laughs>